Welcome to the newcomers and the free first uh, thousand people. So uh, this is the first of our two talks about uh, FreeBSD containers and virtualization. So this one is about thoughts, uh, container system, a way to manage containers in FreeBSD. So please, I think you can go. Yeah, have a one minute. Yeah, some small talks before. I mean, I would like to wait uh, the right time, so if I'm coming up. Uh, just presenting myself. Uh, my name is Luca Pizzamiglio. Could you switch? Um, I'm previously enthusiast since eight, nine uh, years, more or less. Uh, post committer, I'm come a freshman, so started in uh, more or less last year. Uh, as job, I work at Trivago, and my main occupation is building a uh, custom repository for FreeBSD. So I use a lot of Baudrillard. Thanks, who did it? Uh, this is a system that allows you to customize your rep uh, package repository uh, on FreeBSD. So that's who am I? Uh, uh, what was the, my motivation that drove me to uh, start this kind of project? Um, technically, I don't have a real good definition about what a container is. It's kind of virtual system, but it's not a virtual machine, but it's not, a pro I mean, it's something in between. You know, it's, for me, it's kind of a clean environment when you can run uh, something that looks like a virtual machine, but it's not a virtual machine. It's kind of virtualization of the operating system level. Uh, why I needed this kind of instances? Um, as a pod committer, pod maintainer, I really need sometimes a clean environment to test my ports. Uh, oftentimes when you build software, you have unexpected connections. Uh, Autoconf is really bad. It takes the wrong library, uh, wrong configuration. So if you have a clean environment, it's pretty easy. This is what Pujer does. But to develop a new port, Pujer is not really a nice <coughs> platform. It's nice to build, to manage all of them, but not to develop stuff. Um, another personal needs was to, uh, source tech is a kind of configuration management uh, tool. I really needed to run on my laptop some network uh, virtual environment to have client server uh, configurations to run several stuff. Uh, to run web services, nowadays you don't have any application anymore, you have web services to do stuff. And I really like to push in these directions also on my laptop. There are already some solutions available on uh, FreeBSD, basically based heavily on jails, like EasyJail, IOCage, uh, but I have the feeling that they didn't really provide what I needed. Moreover, um, it's open source, means that if you want to reinvent the wheel, you can do it, so it's, my motivation was also that. Um, I had other for instance, EasyJ doesn't support easily uh, DSCP configuration. If I run on my laptop, normally you don't have fixed IPs, but you have a DSCP on one network and you want to uh, virtualize the network inside. Um, I want it without any shame, imitate Docker. I don't like Docker 100%, but there are a lot of use cases where Docker is really a killing feature, I mean, killing technology. And FreeBSD doesn't provide the similar uh, user friendliness that Docker has. So I tell say, mm, I saw other developers using Docker, oh, what this could be nice to have something similar. Um, automation that provide more user-friendly uh, command line interface. Also wanted to, something that I build up for myself so I can experiment different solutions, taking wrong paths also, uh, different concepts. And of course, was for me uh, an opportunity to learn more about FreeBSD technologies. I didn't develop any new features to FreeBSD. I just used what already available was, basically. JS, ZFS, uh, PF, RCTL, CPU set, whatever we spoke about later. Uh, what is POT? POT is basically just a tool that automates the management of my container model. So it's just a bunch of shell scripts until now because it's, everything is just command line tools that create data sets, run uh, JS, uh, create com mm, network cards, whatever. So no need for 
higher uh, programming languages. Advanced features probably will need better stuff, so we'll see. Um, where the name comes from? Pot is, you know, is used to cook and can contain something like <coughs> pasta. I'm Italian, so obviously uh, cook and pasta <laughs> is the right analogy for that. Um, the idea is when you cook pasta, you see the tomato sauce pasta and carbonara spaghetti. In both cases, even they're completely different, but you start with a pot, boiling water. So you put the salt, and then you put the pasta to cook. So there is a kind of reusable start or beginning from the recipe. So it's, that was the idea uh, to have a different concept inside my containers to be able to reuse some stuff, basically reuse the pot. Also, it's three letters that is important when you have command line. Don't write PBSD container, new technology, it could be uh, a huge common line. This pot is short, three letters, easy. Um, what is, there's no new ideas. I just copy good ideas from there and there. Uh, so what I thought, OK, <laughs> would be like to split um, a FreeBSD system in three logical components. You have FreeBSD base, the packages, and basically customization means everything else. Uh, it would be nice to have these three logical components separated into three logical like this partition, ZFS dataset, basically. Who knows exactly what ZFS dataset is? So uh, ZFS is the file system for uh, FreeBSD. And you have to imagine that that's in this case, dataset like a logical partition inside of a tree structure. So you can create separate partition, disk partition in this case. And I put in one partition the FreeBSD based stuff, in another partition the packages, and the other partition the customization. I found a way to uh, combine them and recreate a proper FreeBSD tree. Uh, what is good in the FreeBSD is that the tree is already well separated. All packages, for instance, are installed under USR local, so they are not mixed up with everything else. So that's helped me a lot. And then I have a bunch of symbolic link that create, make, make it possible. Box images. Um, basically, what you have when I create a pot, I, have, I need a base. As you see, the base 11 this is the first thing that you have uh, to do when you create uh, a new system, let's say. And then you can create a pot A. I mean, this, uh, another pot. The name is A, just to be abstract. I call it level 1 because as you see by the name, using the base 11.1, this is the same base, where that every box that you see is a ZFS data set. When you create this level 1, it takes this part as a refer uh, reference, and it uses the same base. Basically, it's mounted in read-only, so it's not duplicated. It's exactly the same one. And it's using the same component, and those are um, just for the pot A. In this case, I use, again, the same components. And I customize with packages and customization about the configuration. The point is, is to be able to reuse completely one data set from one pot to another one. Maybe a little bit more clear with the command line workflow. Uh, Potin is just to initialize everything. Uh, create base is able, it creates basically the uh, the base that you can reuse. You can specify version of FreeBSD. That means that you can have uh, multiple versions. For post committer it's pretty useful because time to time something doesn't work on 10.3, but I have a current and you need some different versioning. Uh, so it's really useful to have multiple bases. The create base basically download FreeBSD 11, create all data sets, and create the pod base, I mean this level zero reference. Then we pot create PA B11 means which base should I use, and you create these new pots creating those uh, the package data set and the customization data set, and the same for the pot B. Then there is a command start and stop. What start does it mount all data set in the proper manner to create uh, a valid free business system, and then it starts the container that is basically a jail. 
Wir stoppen bei, äh, das ist Stuff in der Reverse Order. Stop the J, R Mount, ZFS Dataset. Um, the point to have this kind of read only mount, this mechanism, is to exploit. Uh, I mean, the problem is you can, with new virtualization trend, uh, imagine container, you have virtual images for everything. People, it's so easy to create new virtual images uh, that nobody will really manage them. Because then you can create 50. Uh, hundreds of virtual machines, and you say, ah, we have to run a security upgrade, a security fix, and you have to go in all machines, in all virtual machines, and upgrade them. In this case, if I make some modification in the first one, I can see immediately this. I can use it as reference. If I make modification there, I can see immediately the modification here because it's mounted via nullfs. That means it's really the same component. It's not duplicated. It's, it's really the same. So a modification there is immediately applied to every, comp uh, every container that is using the same uh, data set. Questions so far? Yeah. To create the base, is it like uh, a bit like Fedoria Gel, then you can um, build from source the grab binaries? Uh, no, currently it's just binary download, okay. extract them. Yeah. It's not yet so sophisticated. Um, When I start to play with it, I uh, say, OK, um, three, five system components usable as building blocks are not enough uh, for my uh, vision of the future, let's say. Uh, so I would need more five system components. I would really see a way to build a f um, an image as a building blocks. I would like to add a code repository or a database or caches and reuse them in several Uh, occasion. So um, I'm using Solvemaster as an example, uh, the real example. Um, basically, what I do, we have configurations, for instance, for our servers stored on Git. So I have my repository there on my laptop. I make some modifications and I use a specific uh, container to run the server. I don't want to use my laptop as a server, so I can isolate. Uh, in an isolated environment, in an isolated network, I can use the same repository, but I use the container just to run the server instance. And I can use my laptop to develop new stuff and do whatever I want. So uh, then all my credentials are on my laptop, are not in the container. The container is just the executor. It's like the server. So for do that, uh, I get also a different concept called file system component. So you can add other pieces, other ZFS data set. So you create a component, for, uh, create a pod, and then with add consistent component, you just say uh, which pod, uh, which consistent component, and where has to be mounted. <coughs> Podre was really an inspiration for that because uh, it's basically what, what it does. Uh, but it's a... Um, may I ask what yeah. does what, what that uh, B uh, option mean? Is it a package or...? B? Uh, B, B, uh, B. Fast. No, P is the name, the pod name. So the app here, the persistent component called the repository, P is the part. So here, yeah, I'm adding the, this persistent component to this part, and this is the mount point. Uh -huh, yeah. uh, normally, I use P for the part name, F for persistent components, B for bases, mm -hmm. just to. <coughs> I'm trying to be consistent in all common lines, but yeah. Uh, test analogy, again. Uh, in this case, I have other type of spaghetti. What that means, it can not just use the same part of the recipe if I'm cooking with my pasta and my, uh, my pot. Here, I can even cook two different dishes with the same physical part. I can cook uh, spaghetti there. And then when it's cooked, I can serve one uh, with carbonara and the other one with ragu, in this case. So that means the reuse is can be pushed even further. This is a real example that I'm using on my laptop. Um, I forgot to mention what the level is. The level is the number of ZFS data set or file system component that I'm mounting in read-only. In this case, I'm not reusing only 
the base, so the uh, FreeBSD base, but also the package. Here I have a level one reference uh, container where I install everything that is related to SaltMaster. And here I have two instances that are using those definitions. And they have just the customization inside them and an external repository outside. In this case, I have two instances of the same server with two different configuration and two different repository. But I have only one package uh, data set and only one base data set. So it's to push the reusability even further. I'm not sure if it's allowed to do that. Um, this is the workflow. It's similar to before. Uh, I create persistent components. I create uh, <laughs> the, the level one part. And here, it's slightly different. I just say, OK, use salt base as reference, because it's a level two. That means you don't have to use only one um, uh, um, data set in Ridoli, but even two. And then I add the uh, different system components. And this is a kind of real case that I have on my laptop. Question so far? Yeah. There is any limit with the levels? Mm. Uh, the question was about uh, there is a limit about levels. Yeah. Uh, there, are, um, yeah, there is only two levels. Okay. Um, I was thinking about it. There, there, are, there are technically some problems. Uh, if you want to reuse more stuff, it can be tricky. For instance, if you have a PHP package, uh, a server can be Nginx or Apache. All are packages, and you have only one of them. You cannot combine. Uh, here I have Apache. Here I have PHP. They are mixed in the in the tree. So for directory perspective, it be, could be really tricky to do that. Uh, probably possible, but I don't see really. It can be too complicated. Yeah. Network side, um, currently pod support automatically two uh, network configurations. One is inherit, typical use for uh, build. It means that inherit the network stack of your, of your machine. So you don't have any configuration. You cannot expose any services outside it, but you can have access to internet or whatever. Or you can create a virtual network inside your uh, laptop. It's exploiting VNet. That is not yet officially activated in FreeBSD kernel, so that means that you have to rebuild your kernel. Um, in head, it's already activated. Nice. Um, it's supported by PF using a net. Just look in the big picture. Basically, this is the host. Uh, in the configuration file, you specify the big stuff about your network, the network addresses, uh, the internal gateway. This is the, the gateway for your internal network. And this is currently my uh, network interface. Those are uh, possible paths. Every uh, container has a, I would say, a, a IP address. And the system automatically creates this pair of network cards. One will belong to the container. One stay outside in the host. You just attach the, uh, the card to the bridge. And then if you have an internal communication, is use the bridge. Uh, if you want to go out, it just via uh, PF is going out. Uh, currently, it supports IPv4. Probably in the future, I add IPv6. If you are using a IPv6 only network, it doesn't work. I tested before, so it's, um, it's not yet ready. I guess there is some uh, trick I have to do uh, with the net. It's just really trivial configuration. The good part is in just during the creation, when you say, hey, use as internet address one of these, it automatically creates the infrastructure that you have, that you need. Uh, there are several missing features in this area. Uh, for instance, uh, it would be nice to have a container directly attached to your network card. So having a fixed address, which is what JS support. Uh, my system doesn't support yet, uh, but it's 
should be easy to do. Uh, I would like to add a small tool to help management of this network system because a kind of static manage uh, I cannot run a, d a real DHCP inside. Uh, so something like that. And the third part I'm working on it is expose network services in inside this virtual network. So basically, uh, I already done the work about uh, uh, DNS part. You can create an internal automatic DNS part. Uh, that work as an internal DNS for uh, the system based on console. So um, your container can start, register the services to console, and then they are reachable uh, via DNS. And then with an Azure, for instance, a load balancer like HProxy, in your host, you can make everything available, dynamic, uh, microservice friendly, or this kind of stuff. <laughs> but it's still ongoing. Uh, it's using tooling from other uh, suppliers. Technically possible, there is no limits to do that. Um, what is heavily based on ZFS? Everything there is a ZFS data set. ZFS, if you don't know, uh, you can do magic stuff like taking a snapshot of a data set. Uh, so you can take a snapshot of a pod. So you have a container. Uh, oh, that is nice. I can take a snapshot, so I can, and then I can reuse these snapshots uh, in several ways. For instance, I can make some mod test modification, and then mm, it doesn't work. You can roll back and reuse the snapshot that you take before. Um, so those are pretty useful um, features, and they are for free. You can even clone a snapshot. And that can be used to clone a pot. I have a container. Oh, this is nice. I can clone it because I want to run some modification. I, I want to test something. So you can uh, clone a current container and make your experiments or whatever. You can rename it. That looks like trivial. But believe me, it's not trivial when you have a lot of a, a three that has to be renamed inside. But it's doable. The work in progress is the promote. Is a kind of tricky concept. Is uh, basically when you have a snapshot and then you clone it, and then you decide that your clone is better than the original one. You want to say, okay, the experimental one now is my uh, yeah, it's my production tree. It's not the other one. So you want to exchange the uh, in, let's say the importance of them. So this is what Pot Promote does. Um, in a real use case, you have, I don't know, you have a production container that runs some web service. You make a clone, you test your stuff there, and then you won't change them. And in this case, you need a features like promote. Because otherwise, the snapshot stay attached to the original one that you wanted. The snapshot stay attached to the new one. Small ZFS stuff, but uh, missing feature to have this kind of nice uh, cloning uh, availability. Then. Uh, flavors. Basically, you have two kinds of flavors. The first is typical one, provisioning. EasyJ, LKH provide them. That means you can write a shell script that is run inside your container at the beginning to make an initial terraforming, provisioning, contextualization, you name it, what you can be. And there is also a possibility to have two flavors. I mean, the default one, that for all your containers there is the same one, and then customization. And then I extended the concept of flavor also with a set of pot commands. For instance, I want to attach my system components automatically, because I know that I can do it. So I can write um, a script that does this uh, kind of feature, possible to enforce priorities. For instance, I want to run a pot container with a client. And I can attach automatically the server. So before start the server and then the client, this kind of prioritization. Um, this is an example, quite rich. Uh, this is imitating Podger, this game. Uh, if I want to have a building system to build packages, basically, uh, or to test stuff, the f I have create this flavor called build port. Uh, I have two files. One is the pot script, so to say, and the other is a real shell script. The, uh, here is adding basically all five system components that I need or that I want. 
and that will be the, the script that will be executed inside. Basically, it's adding uh, the post tree where the dist files, basically the source file, were are uh, downloaded. So if I have different posts, they don't have to download every time the same. Just more question about the, the script. Are you running it through the uh, first boot uh, mechanism, or are you building your own? Um, the question was about um, if I'm using the first boot or I'm using a mechanism of my own. I just start the container. I copy before the script there, and I run it. No sophistication at all. It's really easy, easy there. Uh, yeah, and other question about? Uh, yeah, we spoke about uh, runtime dependency. Uh, there is this add dev command that allows you to create a runtime dependency to different containers or pods, whatever you want to call them. Um, this is client server uh, architecture. So if you have a container is a server, container is a client. In the client, you can add a dependency uh, to the server. In this case, you have a salt minion client that is used for testing, and this is a server this master. When I start the salt test, automatically I say, oh, so Plastic is already running, yes, good, no, I have to start it, and then I run it myself. So you can create a kind of error sheet uh, inside it. We can speak about four hours about resource limitation. I add it because it looked like really cool. Believe me, it's not. Uh, <laughs> seriously, it looks like really a really nice topic, but doesn't work. Um, I had that CPU set, CPU set is the command uh, available in FreeBSD batteries in all Unix to uh, stick some processing, in this case container, to specific CPUs. With this command line, I say that the pot name pot, fantasy, uh, is running on CPU 0 and 2, and only on those two CPUs, not, nothing else. Uh, in this case, I can limit the usage and the conflicts between uh, different mm -hmm. containers running on the same machine. Um, there is a kind of, I would say, race condition, so to say. Uh, I cannot run the commands before the jail is created. Uh, I have a patch for that, so that CPU set is inside the jail command directly. So it's planned. Nice. It's nice. Uh, so just. Repeat uh, that will be uh, will be solved with CPU with J's that will be support uh, CPU set inside. Uh, I would like to have uh, improvement. Currently, this uh, minus C zero two means that you are in the configuration. You say that this container run on CPU zero and CPU two is not dynamic at all. Uh, I would like to just say, hey, use two cores, not which one. So just uh, when you start the container, it identify which is less used and allocate smartly way. Missing feature, it, it will come. Um, then I start to play with RCTL. Who knows RCTL? It's still deactivated. You can confirm it. Uh, it's not yet activated as a framework. It's a limit uh, resource. I would say limitation resource management framework inside FreeBSD. Um, you have to activate it at boot time. I currently use it a lot to show resources used by your container. You can see how much memory is your container using, how much virtual memory, physical memory. There is an estimation about IO operations, and so on. Uh, theoretically, you can use it also to limit those resources. For instance, you can say, hey, I don't want this. My container use more than one gigabyte of physical memory. Uh, <laughs> such a bad idea. <coughs> First of all, normally you have to say, how much memory? And you don't have really a clear idea. How, what can be a limit for a container? I don't know. It could be reasonable to have one gigabyte. could be two gigabytes. You don't really know exactly. Uh, and then I make some experiment to understand what happened when it's reaching this limit. I mean, I'm creating a denial of service. It's crashing everything. 
is going out of memory, what's, what's the effect? So I, can, uh, I have an instance of salt master. I say, okay, how much memory is using? An empty salt master, I mean, it's a Python server, 430 megabytes doing nothing. I say, okay, try to put some limitation. So I say, slightly, 400 megabyte, still working, no complaints. I say, well, how is it possible that the system run with 30 megabytes less? Be aggressive, 200 megabytes, still working. But some time was above, so the first question was, okay, if it is above, it's not so bad. It's not crashing, I mean, the, the, the features is saved. But leave it, 50 megabyte, still working. But 10 megabyte, still working. That, I was really, really confused. And I looked, uh, the, what it does, it's basically force processes to um, free all physical memory that are not really necessary to use. Basically, that all read-only pages, like text segments and so on. So uh, in this case, it was a pro uh, Python process. So all Python processes, there were several Python processes. Every could take, I don't know, 50 megabytes, and a few of them was restricted to 40 kilobytes. Because as minimum working set, the, the working set is uh, a nice operating system theory uh, name, and actually it's exactly what it does. It's reduced the working set of your processes at minimum. It can have performance penalty, because obviously working set, there is a reason to, to keep uh, those pages in memory instead of loading every time all of them. Um, I wouldn't suggest to use this kind of limitation because I mean, just with it, it's, it doesn't feel really correct. It's good to have somehow a way to uh, avoid uh, or to control what several containers are doing to avoid mixing, I mean, one container go crazy and affecting the whole system. Uh, but still, I'm questioning about how good uh, this kind of limitation can be. Um, the question was about uh, if these constraints are affecting all other containers. No, it's per container. So you can say, okay, please, this container use just 10 megabytes. It, you can, yeah, it's somehow good, but first of all, it's not respected because it's only that uh, read-only pages can be uh, drop off. If you, uh, you have to load an image or data that can, can, has to be modified, has to be there. They stay there and they use memory. So it's not a strict uh, constraint. So uh, because otherwise you have uh, you're killing what out of memory uh, and the other process die and you are not happy as well because then you have denial of service. I mean it's not really something that you want. It's it's controversial as a topic because when you reach the limit, what happened? still struggling with what could be. I mean, it's usable, it's still there. I mean, I, I left these features there uh, because it can be useful. You can prioritize, basically, also the, the usage of memory in your, uh, in your system. But my suggestion is leave the memory management to the operating system is doing the best job. You have to keep an eye, okay, what's using more. But free memory is waste memory. So this is what a lot of people used to say. Uh, really shortly, pCPU is percentage CPU. RCTL theoretically allowed to limit the percentage of CPU used by a container or a process or something like that. I wasn't able to use it really. Uh, I, found, I, I don't know if it's a bug or not. I need time to, to identify it. Uh, I use stress and G as a stressor, stressing CPU, user space, everything was fine. I say, okay, use 60% of CPU. It was using 60% of CPU, nice. Then I say, okay, use uh, fork stressor. Start to fork as a hell. And the <coughs> CPU percentage users was around 25,000 percentage. I say, how can be possible, it's a four core. It cannot reach 250. I, it, it, I guess there is something wrong in the counter. But what I've seen is how it works. If you reach this limit, the process are stopped, completely stopped, full stop, frozen. 
did not go for any further. So uh, I ex saw this delay of seconds because I have to reach again this 60 uh, percent of usage. It was 2,000 and go back to. It's checked time to time. It's not a really strict. I mean, you cannot say a process, hey, run smoothly. You have to check. Uh, it starts to run, and then you say, oh, you use too much resources, so you stop it. And then, OK, uh, now you have more time to use it, and then you stop it. So it's uh, kind of strange behavior, uh, pushing some delay that is not really easy to observe. Uh, I would prefer to use CPU set. You limit the number of cores that you are using more than limiting the percentage of uh, it, I mean, it's easier and uh, uh, probably is stress less the scheduler. If someone knows better than me how RCTL works on PCPU, please help me in this case. Probably is is a bug. I would say this, this number is. Talk to Travis. Uh, Question so far. Have you tried uh, since FreeBSD 11? There is uh, IO throttling. Uh, are you? IO throttling, you can say uh, the bandwidth uh, or the number of IOPS you want to allow a container to use, which can be useful for a person that goes crazy and try to uh, write a lot. And you can say, okay, I will limit this one. Have you tried it? Uh, the question was about uh, another uh, way, IP, IO? IO, uh, input output uh, throttling. Okay, there is, a, yeah, there is a way to limit IO. Uh, no, I didn't do it okay. yet. Uh, my idea was basically to add. Uh, alt Q to limit the usage of bandwidth uh, between containers to prioritize the usage of the network card or something like that. Uh, but I'm still developing, uh, discovering new stuff there and there. But please, you can submit patches. Help me with that. Moon <laughs> <laughs> uh, shot, the big picture. I mean, currently, so what we have now, a system, just a bunch of shell script. I did it in the last three months, in my spare time. So really green system. Uh, I'm the only user, so it's full of bug. <laughs> but uh, working on it, I have kind of big picture. What could be really nice? Uh, for instance, I'm trying to port um, Electron on FreeBSD that use uh, a library based on Chromium. That means it has to build Chromium itself. If you ever <coughs> compiled Chromium on your own, you'll notice only the sources compressed are around 500 megabytes. It takes normally on a server with multi-core 10 hours, I would say. Something like that on your, my laptop could take two days. So I say, well, I start to work on it. I would like, uh, would like to take my container and move to a powerful server and do the work there. Currently, I cannot. But uh, for you, for people that doesn't know, ZFS snapshots can be transferred per network. So theoretically, I can send I, I, a pod is a collection of ZFS dataset. So I can just send them to another server and then uh, allow this container to run somewhere else. So it's not impossible to do it. Uh, so imitating Docker Hub or something like that. Uh, this is just a bunch of uh, pods. You have a snapshot exporter, so you can uh, have to take um, snapshots for every container that you have. But the good part is uh, locally, you just need, uh, for instance, one instance of the base 11. Because all of them, they are based on the same uh, base 11, just need one of them. Uh, the same for everything is using read only. And the, uh, the good part of those snapshots is that you can send <coughs> incremental snapshots. That means if you have already sent, uh, if I have an update or an upgrade from, for example, for instance, package PHP, oh, new version, I create a new snapshot and I send here only the differences between the previous uh, data set and the new one. And then all of them are immediately upgraded to the new version of the uh, of the layer. That is the vision. I don't know if it really works in a production environment. I have no idea. So I would like to add more feature and to try it one day. Uh, and then nice name for orchestration. Yeah. Uh, that's basically I have. <coughs> 
I hate automatically, fully automatic orchestration. I truly believe that doesn't work. Uh, <coughs> but here is, it's just boxes. Uh, I really like to use LibreOffice and the mouse. So that's why I created this, but there's no real meaning on that. It's just, uh, you know, I have a bunch of, I have four web services. I distribute them. Uh, the yellow one are just kind of sort of backup, but all the intelligence is in the load balancer. So it's, this is my personal uh, vision of orchestration. I can send my containers uh, there, and it's the load balancer that keeps them ready to be used, uh, running in parallel, or whatever. But still, this is really far, way far to, to, to be uh, implemented. Uh, first conclusion, the project is on GitHub. Fork it, submit requests, issues, whatever, please use it and give me a lot of feedback. Because <coughs> as the only user, I know that it's, it's broken. Um, something that is really good to remember, uh, containers cannot be better than the operating system that is under the hood. So making some Docker comparison, they say, OK, Docker does this stuff in this way because Linux has these features. FreeBSD is different, so you have that ZFS data set, you can do different stuff. I wouldn't say better, worse, I don't care. It's just different because I'm using the operating system has different peculiarity, different features, and that's why it's different. And, but you cannot overcome this kind of stuff. If there is no process isolation, you cannot do it. Without JS, I cannot do this kind of containerization or something like that. Uh, yeah. Thanks for coming. Really enjoyed to do it. Uh, question? I would be around here, whatever, but don't be shy. <laughs> yeah. Um, are you aware of the new uh, Podria image command? Uh, no. So it's basically the same idea as what you're doing, uh, except that, uh, well, it's mixing the various components. OK, I have a jail already. I have packages. And uh, it's on a repository and stuff like that. If I mix all of that, I can make a USB stick, an image, or uh, pro provisioning something for a container system that I don't have. And uh, I think it would be a good idea to see how both can work together so that uh, Pudri can generate some kind of uh, data snapshots that you can uh, import using your product. And so you have some kind of provisioning tool that you will reuse. Uh, the question was about Pudri image, uh, a new command of Pudri that can create. An image with uh, already packages created uh, to be ready to be used, kind of USB stick that you can already install with your custom custom version of FreeBSD packages and so on. I wasn't aware of that. Uh, one one idea was for me was um, create packages with Podrier, uh, run a pod that install these new freshly uh, experimental uh, packages in a container or a multiple container, especially if you have web server to test or distributed system to test, this can be really useful to automate all this kind of stuff and create parts that just install new stuff, test them, look how it goes. Uh, also to create, to, to test, uh, upgrade procedures. I take a snapshot of a part, uh, so this is always the current stuff or the previous stuff, so I run an upgrade, I see, okay, there's a conflict, wow, there's a conflict, and I can test uh, also database, I mean, current situation, uh, comparing them, and so on. So that was my idea as components to attach to, to Podia, but it would be really nice to have this kind of output. Yeah? What about documentation? Ha! <laughs> uh, documentation, the question was about documentation. Uh, yeah, uh, it's... <coughs> <laughs> <laughs> there is... A super, there was super nice uh, read, uh, read me um, on GitHub. Uh, it's zero percent, I would say. Uh, I have to work, especially to how to do this stuff. I mean, uh, yeah, okay. that's also why I need feedback because I know how to do it. I know under the hood, but mm, and please ask me most of it for recent examples or whatever. Of them, then I could import that existing jail as a base layer. 
Uh, no. Uh, the question was about if I had a way to import existing J's to uh, to part. No, I don't have this, but not yet. Uh, I said I, it's fully customized on my needs because I'm the only user. So, but feel free. Will. Join the community, do it. <laughs> I really enjoy to, to have more people working on it. Uh, because, I mean, it, to me, it's a cool idea, but alone I cannot do really, it's potentially a lot of work, a lot of use cases that I cannot really manage. You can probably just, you know, uh, create your pre existing jail in his structure and then import it, I guess. Be. Because it's ju if it's just set up as data structure. Um, Um, the question was, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, it's still something that I'm struggling. This stratification is really needed. That is still something that I'm questioning about. I mean, splitting base and packages is really needed, or they can be condensed in only one, and who cares about uh, the customization is obviously different. It's per container, but the other can be, because if what I'm doing, basically, if you have a base that is uh, clean, then you make a clone. But I'm cloning it, so uh, only the differences are stored on the disk. So it's it's not a waste of space and uh, still struggling. Uh, the idea was really to split them to send to reuse as much as possible or something like that. Uh, but it can create problem currently. I guess uh, Easy Jail, for instance, create only one uh, ZFS data set for the whole jail. Uh, No, currently, I mean, it's possible to, to make something. I mean, you can also recreate stuff. I mean, with, um, um, with flavors, you can technically recreate really easily. Uh, you have no time to make a short demo. I can really show this. It really take 30 seconds to create uh, a pot. If the base is already there, it's really just run it because ZFS clone is immediate. Run the jail, it takes two seconds, so creating a new pot is zero time. Can, technically, we can do it. It's, why not? I have here already the line. <laughs> this is a complex one. Uh, I create a pot called test. It's readable for everyone. Make it bigger. Um, pot called test based on a base uh, 11.1 with a uh, IP address of my internal network. Uh, I'm using the build port flavor, and I want to use the DNS as a port instead of inheriting the DNS uh, configuration from my host. And it was completely clean, and this is what it takes. It just launched the DNS, for instance. Uh, it creates. Um, the pod and it's running all, and it's the, uh, that's it. It's running all the flavor. So to run a flavor, it has to run the container, run the flavor inside, stop it. So that's why it takes a little bit. But that's I created a container, and I don't know, two seconds. Everything is already there. That's why it's so easy. Certainly, you don't have to download every time everything. Uh, but that's what more or less uh, I did. And just to make pot ls v. Yep. This is the container that I just created. It's called test. Uh, this is the IP. It's currently not active. Uh, those are the data set, and those are the names, and then where they are mounted. So that's why migration is, uh, is a bit tricky, because um, what pot does is forcing conventions to, b to know exactly what, where data sets are, where to be mounted. So. Uh, that's it's to make automations. Otherwise, it can be hard to make this kind of automation uh, with stuff. Uh, but basically, that's it. If I make. Yep. I, 
activated, and now, I mean, if you see uh, the network is inside, there is only a little bit smaller. Yeah, this is the network configuration inside. We have the this address. If I go out and I make if config each zero probably. And this was automatically created. It wasn't active before. It was, ah, the, the bridge is missing, creating it uh, with the gateway address. And is adding, what is it, uh, member. I have the ePair network card added automatically. I mean, it's, it's just pushing more automation. You don't have to need all tricks to, to use it about network and so on. So that was my. Uh, I try to make stuff easier. I would say that time is over. So. Right.